Welcome to today's InsideSales.com webinar, Top Tips from the World's Best Sellers, featuring Jill Conrath, Brent Adamson, Jeffrey Gittimer, Grant Cardone, Jack Welch, and Dave Matson. A few months back, as part of our Sales Acceleration Summit, we asked these all-star sellers to give us their top sales acceleration tips. They said it was kind of hard to take everything they know and sum it up into a 15-minute session, but that is what they have done. Today, we present these sessions to you. There's two ways to watch. You can stick around and we'll play all the sessions one right after the other, or you can use the sessions tab and jump ahead and watch the ones you want. I also suggest bookmarking this page and coming back and watching the ones that you miss. We also have some great resources today. There's a sales cadence uh, playbook ebook that you can check out, and there's also an on-demand webinar that you should look at. With that, we'll jump into uh, Jill Conrad's session, Experimenting with Sales. Up next is a special session made possible by Microsoft. Jill Conrath has some ideas that will literally change your thinking. She's the best-selling author of Agile Selling and Snap Selling, both number one Amazon sales books. Her first book, Selling to Big Companies, was selected by Fortune Magazine as one of eight must-reads for salespeople. Jill began her sales career at Xerox, then moved into technology sales, and finally into selling services. She's worked with companies like IBM, GE, and Microsoft, and has been featured on ABC News, Fox, Forbes, and many other publications. You know what I think? I think you're working too darn hard. Now, some of you out there, when you hear me say that, are going, yes, that's exactly right. I am so working my tail off. I'm running a million miles a minute, and I can't possibly get everything done. And you're right. And for those of you who are sales leaders, you're probably thinking, oh, geez, Jill, why did you say that? I'm really trying so hard to get my people to work harder. You know, this is all about hard work. We've got numbers to meet. I don't want you giving them another excuse to not do their job. Well, let me just say I'm not giving anybody an excuse. I just want to face the facts as they really are. I honestly think people are working too darn hard. But let me explain my rationale, because it may be a bit different from what you think. You know, I've been in sales a long time, and over the years I've looked at two different factors that often seem to be competing with each other. On one hand, we have the efficiency factor. How many calls can you make? What is your conversion ratio? And it's anything to do with the numbers. So we've got efficiency over here. But we also have another factor that we need to take into consideration, and that is effectiveness. They are both important to being successful in sales. Yet, I don't find people working on that effectiveness one very often. Honestly, I find all the factors over here on efficiency. People go through sales training once, if they go through it at all, and they say, well, I've learned how to sell. But no, no, that's not the truth. You've learned how to, to go through sales training, and you've learned what you've been taught, but then you've gotten back to your desk if you're a salesperson, and you've started doing things your way. Your way. And that's good, because we all need to personalize the sales experience. Except, hmm, is your way the most effective that you can be? Is it? Now that's what I always say to people and I always try to get them to question that they know what they're doing and that their way is not um, necessarily the best thing in the whole wide world, that there may be options that could help them get better. So the reality of it is we are working hard, but we're working way too hard because we are not working at our best level. We're not working at really what we're capable and you know, capable of actually doing. So I, I want to challenge the thinking today. I want to get you who are listening to a lot of different webinars, I want to get you to think about how can you take what you're learning and do something different from it. And I even want to get you to question everything that you're doing because to me the essence of of being really good in this profession is to find out how to be more effective. Because when you're more effective, guess what? You don't need as many prospects. Your prospects trust you more. They're easier to close. You're not wasting all this time trying to go out and prospect and get more and more and more in the door. You're taking fewer 
people, you're working with them better, you're having a higher close ratio, and they love you to death and they buy more from you. I mean, to me, that seems like that's the elegant way to sell. Elegant, you know, it's like simple, it's, it's, it doesn't require as much work, and that's what I think we should all aspire to. So I'm not telling you to be lazy, I'm telling you to start thinking about what you might do from a different perspective to change the game so you're more effective and get the results that you want. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, first of all, I'm going to share a couple stories of my own. Uh, several years ago, probably 10 years ago, uh, for the first time in my entire life, I was having trouble with my prospecting. I mean, I had always been really, really good about getting my foot in the door and setting up meetings with corporate decision makers and suddenly no one was answering their phones anymore. You probably know what I mean. Uh, I would send them emails and they would never reply. They wouldn't respond to my voicemail messages. And so I thought, at first I thought, oh my goodness, like I'm losing my mojo. What's wrong with me? And then I started talking to other people and I realized it wasn't just me. Everybody else was having that same feeling. So I actually started experimenting with my prospecting. And I started playing with the, what I was doing to see if I could find a way that was much more effective. Because believe me, I was way, making way too many calls. When sending out way too many emails for the kind of response that I was getting, it was like a total waste of time. So I worked with it and I played with it for almost a year. And again, I, I'm, a serial, I'm a serial experimenter. I like to see if I can find new ways. And, and I came up with a way that actually worked on a consistent and regular basis and could be transported into other professions other than mine. And that's actually what I wrote about in my first book called Selling to Big Companies. But it was through experimentation that I was able to push through the barriers and find out a new way that was so much more effective that saved me an immense amount of time and allowed me to get in with the right people, positioned in a way that was like I was the expert and a credible resource, and it, it, it worked. That was experiment number one. Let me tell you experiment number two. I was working with one of my clients, and they love me, and we've been working on multiple projects, and, and at the end of one of the projects, Bill said to me, uh, Jill, let's get going on the next project right away. And I was excited, and I got back to him a week later, and I didn't hear from him. Uh, he didn't respond, and I thought, well, that's, you know, he's probably busy. So I emailed him, and then I, a couple days later, called him again, and I emailed him. And after a few more messages, I thought, well, geez, maybe I, I didn't understand what he said. Maybe I misconstrued it. And then I kept going, and after about eight messages, I went, Oh my goodness, I have said something to offend this man. And the truth was, I hadn't. But I didn't know that. I sent him an email and said, Bill, I'm so sorry. Whatever I did, I didn't do it on purpose. And he wrote back immediately and said, Oh, Jill, no, no, you didn't do anything. We're just so busy here that we, um, I couldn't get back to you. And I figured you'd understand. And that hit me, and I went, Oh my goodness. Things have really changed around. He's my best customer. isn't getting back to me. We're dealing with crazy busy. And so I immersed myself for a couple of years in crazy busy. And, and I, I, I am a little bit, you know, like I go in the deep end when I want to experiment. But I was really trying to figure out what is the paradigm for selling to somebody who's overwhelmed? And how do you have to work with them to keep decisions from moving along the sales process? Now that led to um, my second book, which was Snap Selling. Okay, fast forward a few years. I mean, I, I think I like these problems. I don't uh, because oftentimes they're mine, but, but the reality of it is I don't think that, you know, if you don't deal with them, you just keep working harder and harder for less return. So most recently, I have been into time, and I have been focusing on how to be more productive and get more done uh, in time. And so I have been hearing that um, that. You, you are more productive and are better during the day if you get a lot of sleep. So I said, maybe I'll conduct a little experiment around sleep. And I have always said for my entire adult life that I can get by on six and a half hours of sleep. I'm fine. If I have six and a half hours of sleep, I can do anything. So I put it to the test. And for um, a couple month period, what I did was I actually would record when I went to bed and then a number of hours of sleep. And then I had a diary right by me in the morning when I got up at my, when I got to my desk. And, and I was, 
recording how mentally sharp I was and at what point during the day did my brain really kick in and allow me to be at the top of my game. Well, what absolutely blew me away was I found out that six and a half hours of sleep, it took me two hours for my brain to really kick into full gear, for me to be at top capacity. But if I had seven and three quarters hours, man, I was shot just like that. I mean, so what I'm telling you is that you don't know this kind of stuff unless you start experimenting. So I'm really going to call you to start experimenting with sales and, and, and invite you to try different things, to see if you can find out new ways of doing things that are so much better than what you're currently doing. Now, what I have always done is I start with problems. You know, you hear me telling you, about, you know, I can't get in, I'm dealing with crazy busy. Uh, but you don't have to start there. But I like starting with problems that I'm experiencing, you know, like, like um, for example, if you're having trouble getting through to people, maybe you should start experimenting with how you approach um, your clients. If you're having trouble, like you do demos, and they're not responding to your demos, and they're not advancing, or maybe they are advancing, but you think you could do better, and you're not content you're not content with the, the ratio that you've got. Say you look at your demos and you say, oh, I'm advancing four out of 10, I'm moving to close. Well, four out of 10 may be good, may be decent, but is it what you're capable of? And could there be anything that you do differently during your demo that would uh, inspire people to take more action, that would help them feel that your product or service was more valuable? I mean, there's so many things you can look at. You can you can, you know, think about even not doing a demo. Or how about PowerPoint presentations? How many of us have presentations that we give to our customers that um, we've used for a while and we're really quite comfortable with it and we think it's good presentation. We think it's good. Okay, that's, that's scary when we think it's good because that means there's always room for improvement. So we've got this PowerPoint presentation. What if we switched it up? I mean, I, I discovered when I was doing research for snap selling and trying to figure out how to deal with the crazy busy customer, I discovered that the last slides in my PowerPoint deck were the most important, and that was the business value that I was providing. And when I, I thought I was supposed to build the story over time to get people to understand you know, who we were, what we did, the kind of problems we solved, and ba bam you know, here's how we can help you, here's the business value. Well, people were getting bored, and they were leaning back, and you know, they check our cell phones to see what was going on, and well, let me see if I can change that. So I ended up switching the whole presentation around where I put the back slides to the front end, and boom, people were right there with me, and they had questions, and, and then they were engaged, and, and it was whole different conversation resulting in whole different results. So that's what I want you to try to think about. You know, I mean, you are on cruise control. I'm on cruise control. We do things the same old way because that's how our brain works. It literally wants us to replicate the, the way that has always worked for us in the past. And, and maybe I shouldn't say worked for us in the past, just the way we're used to doing things. Because our brain is a, an, an energy hog and our and our brain likes to systematize and create patterns as much as possible. And whenever we deviate from the pattern and try something new, our brain goes, oh, God, don't do that. It might not work. Here's the way we do this. And it sends us back to this way of being that is, that is uh, comfortable, but maybe not as effective as we could be. So the, the real challenge is to think, what can we tackle? You know, do we have some numbers that we can look at, like, I have X number of calls that I make and, and, and this but many convert. Well, can you do better? I think this is a challenge that every one of us as individuals should do, but I also think it's a team challenge. And for those of you who are leading teams, there's, a, you know, as a leader of a team, you have each individual that can get better at a lot of different things. And your challenge as a leader is to help them create some experiments where they can focus on doing different things. But you can also do it with your team. You can say, let's as a team do this. And then you could work with them to create some learning experiences, to expand the knowledge base about what's possible, to read what the experts are saying, to attend webinars and study it, and then try different things and see if you can have people on your team who create better ways than what you currently got. I mean, I'm so serious, better ways, because you're working too darn hard. You're working too darn hard. I'm gonna come back to that, emphasize it again. You can do things better, but you can't do things better by continuing to do what you've always done. So listen, go get them, go experiment, 
and have a wonderful sales career. Well, hello everyone. My name is Brent Adamson from CEB. I'm delighted to be with you today to sort of pick up right where we left off at last year's conference with some additional findings from our brand new book, The Challenger Customer, picking up where we left off from the Challenger sale a couple years ago. Now, this book, and particularly uh, the story I want to share with you today, goes deep into the customer organization, trying to understand who inside the customer organization we should connect to to make a B2B deal happen. And really, the core of the lesson is what we found in all of our research. It's not just that you challenge, but who you challenge challenge that really matters as we seek not just to connect individual stakeholders to us, but to connect those individual stakeholders inside the customer organization to each other, as ultimately that indeed is the bigger challenge. So who are our choices? Who should we connect to inside the customer organization to get the deal done? Well, let's take a look. So we have spent a, a huge amount of time over the last several years collecting a large amount of data on customer buying behavior, specifically in the B2B landscape. And as part of that work, we've gathered a lot of information and a lot of data and research on individual customer stakeholder attributes, trying to understand what are the different profiles or flavors of customer stakeholders inside of a B2B purchase. And, and here they are. And again, just for today's purposes, all the methodology aside, we go into that in detail in the book. But what we found is when we went out and gathered a huge amount of data from individual customer stakeholders involved in a business to business purchase across industries, geographies, go to market models, trying to figure out, are they willing to talk to vendors? Are they willing to share information? How open are they to new ideas? How willing are they to collaborate with colleagues? How open are they to change inside their organization? Organization. When we ran the analysis on all of that data, lo and behold, what we found is virtually every stakeholder involved in a B2B purchase has this tendency to fall into one of seven profiles. And here they are on the screen. And there's a, there's a number of caveats that we go into in the book in this. But, you know, one of the things I would tell you is we're not saying that they're mutually exclusive. It's not that you're always one of these seven and none of the other six. But nonetheless, we find that for any given B2B purchase, a stakeholder is going to have a tendency to gravitate to one of these seven in ways that really matter. Now, I'm going to walk you through these, and as I do, here's what I'd like you to think about. And I'd like you to think about this very practically, tactically, for the accounts that you're working on right now, uh, that, or your team is working on right now, because what you're going to find as we go through this is that star-performing sales reps choose to connect to three of these individuals, or groups of individuals in particular, and core performers also choose to connect to three in particular. But there's no overlap between the two. So where would you place your bets? So as you go through this, ask yourself that. Where would you place your bets? And the other thing I'd ask you to do is think of real accounts, real customers that you're working with now, and begin to place names across these profiles. Find real people in your world that match to these profiles. So up in the top left, in no particular order here, up in the top left is the go-getter. Now the go-getter is just that. They're, they're always looking for new ideas. They're that customer inside, the customer stakeholders, you know, always focused on the core organizational strategy. What are the two or three top priorities we got to get done this year? And they're looking for new ideas to help them get after those ideas uh, and those strategies and priorities in ways that maybe they hadn't thought of on their own before. And what we especially like about go-getters is once they find those new ideas, they're particularly good at rallying the troops, putting a project plan in place, and getting after that idea in a very organized step-by-step -step fashion. Next is the skeptic. Now, the skeptic we find is open to new ideas, but they're, well, they're going to approach them with a, well, a very skeptical lens. So they're going to take that idea and they're going to look at it from every possible angle. They're going to pull it apart piece by piece, 
before they decide what to do about it, if anything. And when they choose to move forward on it, they'll move forward relatively cautiously. Top right is the friend. Kind of what it sounds like, the friend is open. They're, they're willing to meet with suppliers. They're willing to meet with just about anybody and give you a sense of what's going on. They love to build those kinds of personal relationships. Bottom left is the teacher. The teacher is the sort of the blue ocean strategy person inside of the organization, the customer organization. They're open to new ideas. They're sort of the visionaries. And they're really good about communicating those ideas and getting people really motivated about them. They're not nearly as good as go-getters about putting project plans in place and getting after them, but they're really good at motivating others to do that on, on their behalf. The guide is sort of the oversharer inside the customer organization. The way that they demonstrate their personal value to others is by demonstrating that they know more than you do. And how do they do that? By telling anybody just about everything. So one of the things we find about guides, they will dish the dirt on just about anything. Next is the climber. The climber is the what's in it for me individual. So they're not nearly as focused on organizational priorities as they are on individual ones. And they will do what they need to do to move up, even if it means that they uh, put themselves ahead of their own company. And finally, the blocker. Now, what's interesting about the blocker down in the bottom right is they're really not all that open to talking to suppliers, but not because they're blocking you per se, but because they're blocking change. They're very strongly oriented towards the status quo. So these are the customers who will tell you, you know, we're in year two of a three-year implementation. So even if you want to talk to them, they don't want to talk to you, not because they don't like you, but just because they don't see a need. All right, so those are your seven bets. Now, the core, there's seven possibilities. The question is, where are you going to place your bets? Well, we were, became fascinated by this as we looked into this research. And, and what, what we did is we took this research here and sort of this profiling exercise of customer stakeholders, and then we compared it to what we found on the sales professional side, the sales rep side. So uh, parallel to this work, we ran a large-scale survey of individual sellers around the world, about 3,000 of them, giving them a whole list of criteria of the types of things that they might look for in choosing or selecting or prioritizing one stakeholder over another. Things like seniority or budget ownership or title or role. And then we simply asked them on a scale of one to seven for any one of those attributes independently, how would you rate the importance of any one of those attributes? And so we took that data and we cut it by star performers versus core performers. And when we ran the analysis, lo and behold, it turns out that star performing sales reps care about two things and two things only when really choosing who to hitch their wagon to inside the customer organization. And the weird thing is the two things that star performers care about most are not the things we train them to care about in the first place. In fact, let me first tell you what star performers don't care about. What they don't care about is seniority, title, budget ownership, decision-making authority, role in the organization. In other words, all the things that we've all been trained to search out, find the senior decision-maker and climb your way to the corner office. That's not really what they're looking for. Instead, what they're looking for is the ability of that individual stakeholder to do two things inside their customer organization. One, to build consensus, which in the world of the 5.4 and all those people we got to connect together inside the customer organization makes a ton of sense. I've got to find someone who can build a bridge to the other 4.4, build a bridge to his or her colleagues. But at the same time, the other thing that we find star performers care about is the willingness and ability of that individual inside the customer organization to drive change. So willingness to build consensus and drive change. And those are the criteria that we look for now when we select customer stakeholders inside the customer organization to deliver a challenger approach. But why those two? So consensus is probably clear based on what we talked about last year. But why change? Why is it that star performing sales reps, without anyone ever having trained them to do this, why are they so focused on finding individuals willing and able to drive change inside their organization? Well, the answer is, is because that's ultimately what we're trying to do in business to business sales. In fact, one of the things we've become so convinced of in all of our work around the world over the last several years is at the end of the day, despite all of our differences across industries and geographies and go to market models, you know what? We all sell the same thing. You know what we sell? We sell change. So whether it's trying to get our customer to stop buying that and start buying this or stop buying our old stuff, start buying our new stuff, stop buying the competition, start buying from us, stop buying the small amount, start buying this big amount, stop doing it yourself, outsource it to us. One way or another, what we're all trying to do is get our customers to change their behavior. Now, why does that matter? Well, left to their own devices, what's the one thing customers want to avoid at all costs? Change. Why? It's hard. It's expensive. It's risky. It's unknown. I don't want to do that. But put those two together and what do you got? Well, the one thing that we're selling is the one thing customers don't want to be buying. It's change. This is why B2B sales is so hard in a world of consensus creation. Because now we've got to not just convince one person to change. We've got to convince all of them to change. The 5.4. So who do we hitch our wagon to to help get that done? Well, it turns out it's the people willing and able to go on that journey with us. To build consensus around that change idea. 
So who among these seven is particularly good at do doing that? Well, it turns out of those seven, three in particular, the go-getter, the teacher, and the skeptic, they're the ones who are especially effective at doing that. So the bar chart you see here is a measure of the, the likelihood to drive organizational action, which is just a synthetic metric for willingness to drive change, build consensus among your colleagues. And then we measured either the impact or the likelihood of each member, uh, members of each of those seven profiles to do that. And what we find is the go-getter, the teacher, and the skeptic, they're open to those new ideas. They're particularly good at getting others rallied around those ideas. They're the ones who get it done. So we give them a name. We call them the mobilizers because that's who they are, the mobilizers of action. They're the ones who can take that idea, build consensus, and drive change around it. Meanwhile, the guide, the friend, and the climber, they'll share information. They'll dish the dirt. They'll tell you what's going on. But it turns out they're not very good at actually making anything happen. And so we've got, so we call them the talkers. So now we've got mobilizers, talkers, and blockers. And these three choices really matter. Now, what's so interesting about mobilizers, talkers, and blockers is this. No one has ever trained us to go do this, to look at the stakeholders in this particular light, but it actually really matters. Because what's so interesting is if you talk to a talker, you know what they're going to do? They're going to share information. They're going to dish the dirt. They're going to tell you what's going on. The conversation is going to feel fantastic. You're going to come away from that potentially knowing more than you ever have. And by the way, that is fantastic knowledge. Don't ever undervalue the knowledge itself. But we take that sharing of knowledge as a proxy as their, of their willingness and ability to actually do something across their organization. And what we found from our data is that's rarely the case. So you come out of that meeting thinking, this is going to be great. It's coming in on Thursday next week. I guarantee it. And then nothing happens. Thursday next week rolls around and it's still out there. Thursday of two months from now rolls around and it's still sitting out there. And you wonder what happened. And the, what happened is we talked to an individual who was willing to have a conversation, but was less willing and less able to go have that same conversation with his or her colleagues. And that's a really tough place to be. In fact, you know, one of the things we always do in a sales meeting, right? We're trained to do this is before you end one sales interaction is schedule the next sales interaction. You know what? A talker will do that to you every single time. They'll do that for you. And you know what you'll do at that next meeting? You'll talk some more. I'll never forget the story of one company we worked with very closely who told us, you know what? They had just closed a huge deal, one of the biggest in our history. And they, the head of sales, his name is Kevin. He was shaking his head when he told me the story. He said, you know what, Brent, let me tell you something about this deal. He said that particular customer had been in our pipeline for 20 years. And we had forecast it every week. And this is what happens when you sell to talkers. It always feels like you're just on the cusp. It's just about to come in. Meanwhile, now think about a mobilizer competition. What mobilizers are looking for is an idea. They're not looking for a value proposition. They're not looking for speeds and feeds. They're looking for an insight. Something that has specifically about their company, not about your company. And when you present that idea to them, they're going to take that idea and they're going to look at it from every possible angle, particularly the skeptic. They're going to pull that idea piece apart, piece by piece. That isn't necessarily going to feel very good, but it's exactly what you need to happen because what they're doing is they're engaging with your insight that you've brought to the table as a challenger sales professional. And that's what matters. Selling to mobilize. Now, meanwhile, blockers on the right, they won't talk to you at all because they don't see a need. It's not that they don't like you. It's just they don't see a need to. So mobilizers, talkers, and blockers. And meanwhile, what's so interesting is when you take this idea of mobilizers, talkers, and blockers, and you measure it against senior decision makers, you know what you find? You find that they don't overlap. There's no predictability in terms of role or seniority in terms of actually being a mobilizer. Yes, one third of senior decision makers are indeed mobilizers, but you know what? A third of them are blockers and a third of them are talkers too. One of our heads of sales put it like this is we need to take our senior decision maker goggles off and put our mobilizer goggles on. And it really means what we need to do is think about how do we engage individual stakeholders inside the customer organization. What we found is we need to engage them with the thing that they're looking for more than anything else, which is not just a big idea or new research and new idea, thought leadership that teaches them that you're smart. What they're looking for is something that we call commercial insight, which teaches them that they're wrong, or at least that there's something that they've missed. So we spend a huge amount of time in this book teasing out the difference between commercial insight and thought leadership, and then more importantly, talking about how to build it. And the second thing we have to talk about, and we talk about in depth in this book, is that this idea is not just finding mobilizers, because they may be willing to mobilize, but they may not necessarily be able to. Remember, it's not just about connecting them to you, but connecting those stakeholders to each other. So once you find that mobilizer, the question becomes, how do we equip them? How do we coach them to connect to their colleagues inside the customer organization? And that becomes important. So we need to show them, here's who you talk to. Here's what to say. Here's the objections they're going to have. Here's how to handle it. Here's a PowerPoint deck to allow you to have that conversation. Here's the data you need to make that happen. And so this is really what the book is all about, is helping our member companies figure out how do I find, how do I support a mobilizer in my efforts to sell change. And so we spend a lot of time with our members thinking about how do we find these individuals? How do we equip them? And all of that work in many ways is laid out in some detail inside the book. And we're excited for you guys to go on that journey with us and more down the road. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll talk to you guys soon.
rock and roll music and why I preach against it, I believe that it is a contributing factor to our juvenile delinquency of today. I know what it does to you. And I, I know uh, the evil feeling that you feel when you sing it. I know the, the, the lost position that you get into in the beat. Well, uh, if you talk to the average teenager of today and you ask them what it is about rock and roll music that they like, and they'll, the first thing they'll say is the beat, the beat, the beat. That was 60 years ago. That was Eddie Cochran. He went down with the Big Bopper and Richie Valens in the saddest day of rock and roll when their plane crashed with Buddy Holly. But rock and roll was a new idea. It was certainly a departure from everything that was happening at that moment, and people were actually preaching against it. I think that preacher became a waiter at Shoney's for his insight. And the same way, selling is changing in the 2000s, in the 2010s, in the 2020s. But a lot of people are against it. They think that the old way is still going to work for them. What worked 20 years ago, remember when your newspaper was delivered to your door? They think that's still going to work. The old way of selling is dead. The only people that don't know it are the salespeople that are still doing it that way and the sales trainers that are still training that way. Cold calling, find the pain, pitch the product, close the sale, and the vaunted customer satisfaction are all bullshit. They don't work anymore. I don't want to find the pain in anybody. It's, you know, what, what, what's your pain? Answer, none of your business. So I'm going to talk about the new sale in a nutshell so I can get right into the meat of this piece. And then I'm going to elaborate a little bit so you can have a better understanding. But today is a 30,000 foot view of things that you need to put into your life and your sales life, not necessarily in that order. The new sale is about value attraction, social attraction, finding the pleasure, not the pain, so you might find something in common, asking emotional-based questions because the sale is made emotionally and then justified logically, discover their motive to buy, not close the sale, confirm the urgency of the offer by finding out their motive and when, Give after the sale value so you might be able to build some kind of relationship and then earn customer loyalty and earn referrals. Notice the word earn. And there's a philosophy. And the philosophy is don't divide your customers into A, B, C, and D. Customers are all the same. You treat them like gold. You never know who they're going to become and you never know who they're going to live next door to. The key for you as a salesperson or a sales manager is daily training and practice getting ready and committing to be your best. Second best in sales is first loser. The way you get to be great is by repeating. Repetition is the mother of mastery. Play a song once, you like it. Play a song five times, you can kind of sing along. But after the tenth time, you can sing it on your own. The great Malcolm Gladwell says, Practice isn't the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. If you offer the best products and service, you better have the best people helping customers buy them, use them, and profit from them. Why don't you tweet this? Best value provider, best service, best response, best value messages, best social seller. This is where you need to be at a minimum in order to earn more business. So I'm going to give you the new rules, and these new rules are not optional. You live by them or you die by them. The first one is get interesting. It's, it is amazing to me how many salespeople will take the response or the rebuff. Uh, we're not interested. Dude, what that means is you're not interesting. Not interested is a report card, not a circumstance. Number two is say it in terms of them. Every single thing that you do must be said in terms of the customer, not in terms of you. They don't care about you. The pitch, the presentation, the slides, everything has to be in terms of how the customer wins. Let me give you some sales presentation reality. The buyer, the prospect, the customer 
expects you to have knowledge about their stuff, not just your stuff. To transfer that knowledge, they need to feel your passion, your belief, your intelligence, your ideas, and your sincerity beyond the hype of your sales pitch. You engage them with new information about them, not regurgitated information about you. Why don't you just email them your sales presentation and say, hey, hey I'm going to meet with you tomorrow. Here's my boring presentation. I'll be there tomorrow to talk about you, your business, and your profit. Once you have the knowledge, you have to have the ideas. If you walk in without an idea, you're absolutely vacant. Ideas that will help them do the one thing that they want to do the most, build their wealth. Everybody has the same product as your competitor. You're selling a copy machine, you're selling life insurance, you're selling a car, same thing. Here's the difference. Your passion, your belief, your knowledge, your value, your ideas, and your communication skills, and your ability to help them meet their needs and achieve their goals are the only differentiators. You have to know their motives, their why, not just your product. Why they want to buy is a billion times more powerful than how to sell. Well, customers want to know, and this is number three, customers want to know all about how they can succeed, not a bunch of crap about you. I don't care about you. I don't, I don't care if the, the, this customer doesn't care if you drop dead right on the other end of your desk. Look at that. That salesman died. Look at that. They don't want an education. They just want answers. They're not waiting around. Boy, I sure hope that sales guy calls so he can educate me. Number four is take a smart risk, avoid a dumb risk. Asking budget or pain questions is a dumb risk. Asking outcome or value questions is a smart risk. Trying to close the sale is a dumb risk. Earning the sale, eh, that's a smart risk. Asking for a referral is a dumb risk. Listen, if you ask somebody for a referral and they don't give you one and they say, well, call me next week, and then you call them next week and say, hey, I was calling about those referrals and I was wondering if you had a chance to come up with one, that guy will not only say he hasn't had a chance yet, he'll never take your call again because he considers you a taker. Why don't you give them value so you can earn a referral? Earning a referral is a smart risk. You've heard the word no risk, no reward. My statement is no risk, no nothing. Number five is study creativity. I am older and I needed a financial plan in order for me to succeed and su succeed my co succession for my company. So I called a couple of my lawyer friends to come over and talk to me. One of my 25 year friends, Rick Marsh comes over and he gives me this picture. He said, Jeffrey, I brought this for you. And I said, what's that, Rick? He says, I want you to put it on your desk and keep it there every day. I said, okay. What is it? He said, this is a picture of the Internal Revenue Service. When you die, one of two things is going to happen. Your kids are going to get your money or the government is going to get your money. And I'm here today to make certain that your kids get your money. Like, <laughs> Okay, you're hired. I didn't ask him where he went to school. I didn't ask him how much it was going to cost. I didn't ask anything. And that was five years ago. The picture's still on my desk. Oh, by the way, the plan is done, and I can't remember what it cost. Find something personal. Do something memorable. Here's an idea. Just because they're important to you does not mean that you're important to them. Oh, my goodness. That's number six, by the way, if you're keeping count. They don't care about you. Just because you are important to them does not mean just because they are important to you. Just because <laughs> they're important to you does not mean that you're important to them. I got to fix my teeth. Got a hot list? Oh, yeah, I got a hot list. Really? Hot for who? Number seven, no shortcuts. Just think long term. If you think, uh, for me, I make all decisions and I take all actions based on the person that I seek to become. And I think you should do exactly the same thing. I don't think end of the month. I think end of time. And number 7.5, you got to love what you do. You don't love what you do, you're toast. If you don't love it, you're never going to succeed at it. Now, this is the year of the sale. I want you to go to jeffreygittimer.com slash gold and look at the webinar list that I've got. 
13 webinars about the new sale and how they will affect your success and your wealth this year. The new sale, cold calling in the 21st century, social selling, how to become a trusted advisor, creativity, the science that separates you from your competitor, why customers buy, and seven more. Just go. Anyone that goes and just signs up to look at the little video that's there, you're going to get my retweetables book, How to Tweet, and 365 tweets that have already been retweeted many, many times. JeffreyGittimer.com slash gold. Here's how you can find me. I want to thank you very much for me and my customer today. I enjoy everything I do with you, and I'm looking forward to you accelerating your sales. Thanks for being my customer. Hey, thanks for joining us at Sales Acceleration Summit. My name's Grant Cardone, and before I get started here, I guess I already have started, actually. Uh, I want to thank Dave Elkington and Ken Krogh, also all the other people at Inside Sales that put on these events. I know how hard it is, how much work goes into it, and how large and creative your commitment is to providing salespeople, sales managers, and sales organizations with the most updated, current, and relevant content so you can be the best at your game. And congratulations to you for taking the time, investing time, energy, and resources in getting that information. If you don't know who I am, I'm sorry, Grant Cardone. I have written uh, five books in the last six years. I have two more books coming out this year. My commitment and dedication since the age of 25 is to help myself as a salesperson become a master at the art of sales as an art, as a career, not just as a job and as a hack. No offense, if, if you are a hack, I've been there, uh, did that, knew it didn't feel good, and have since the age of 25, See, between 18 and 25 years old, I wasn't looking for answers. When I finally got to 25 years old, I'm like, okay, it's the only job where I can make any money. I need to commit and get great at this thing rather than hating on the industry. And the truth is I was really just hating on myself for my lack of abilities and lack of commitment. So congratulations to you because obviously, clearly, you have a commitment for being here. I want to share with you, we just did a webcast out of my offices, my studio in Miami called The Greatest Sales Secret. And I want to give you that greatest sales secret. This was a four-hour and 20-minute live uh, seminar that we webcast. Four hours and 20 minutes. I'm going to give you about 13 minutes of it right now called the greatest sales secret. That greatest sales secret, if, uh, if there was one greatest sales secret, and I believe this is what it would be, it wouldn't be that you're a fast talker. It wouldn't be that you're an extrovert. It wouldn't be that you like people. It wouldn't be that you're good with people. It wouldn't be that you could somehow, you know, feel or intuitively uh, understand people's personality types. It would be this one thing, this one thing. And nobody, nobody that I've ever talked to says, if there was one skill, one simple skill that you had, this would be the Mac Daddy. And it would be this, two words, follow up. How can you creatively follow up with your customer so you have the skills you need? How do you have the creative strategies? And how do you have the different lines of communication so that you can follow up persistently, insistently, and without fail, without ever stopping, and without pesting, pestering or bothering a customer? So that's what we created. How could you follow up with somebody if you wanted to call somebody nine times in six days? Can you imagine that? Nine different times in six days from day zero. Day zero would be the day they called you, contacted you, emailed you, and you would be able to contact them seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 10, 11, or even 14 times over a period of nine days using different lines of communication. Well, that's what I'm going to share with you how to do that. So I'm going to be showing you how to do that in a very short time that we have here today, okay? First of all, you need to know some of the facts, okay? The reason why sales follow-up, whether it's e-leads, retail leads, personal visits, whether it was an internet hit, a phone call, or whether they took the time to drive to your brick-and-mortar company and say hello, okay? You need to understand the facts, and I want to give some of this credit to Inside Sales and King Krogh and all the work those guys do over there. 2% of salespeople, 2% of salespeople make one contact, in, or I'm sorry, 2% of all sales are made on the first contact. That means that's the 98-2 rule. 98% of all your sales. I can literally throw away the 2% and just focus on the 98% and be a superstar in your business. Okay, it's called the 98-2 rule. It is not the 80-20 rule. The reason 20% of the people sell 80% of the products is they understand 
those 20 percenters understand how to follow up strategically and creatively until somebody buys their product, okay? 3% of all sales are made in the second contact. 5% of all sales are made after the third contact. 10% of all sales are made after the fourth contact. That means 90% of all sales have not been made after four contacts. Look, I know companies that say they're calling five to eight times to respond to an internet lead that showed an interest last night and still not making contact. 80% of all sales are made between the fifth and the twelfth contact. So what does that mean? That means if you could learn this one skill, you would be the unbelievable force in the universe and dominate your market and become a leader in your space, okay? Now, ask yourself, why are the numbers 25% of all salespeople don't make the first follow-up call, 48% only make two calls, okay? The numbers are ridiculous. It's crazy. 80% of all salespeople never hit quota. Why? Why is it? Why do people not follow up? This is an age-old question. Sales manager asks me constantly, why do my people not follow up? 64% of all companies don't nurture leads. Why not? Okay, is it you're lazy, you have bad information, you don't know why, too many leads, no plan, you failed at follow-up, lack of motivation, it's not required, no accountability, no management, no commitment. No, it's none of those things. Let me tell you why you don't follow up. It's certainly not because you're lazy. By the way, that is the number one answer. Oh, my people are lazy. No, they're not lazy. Here's the reason why. You don't know what to do. Nobody knows what to do, you don't know what to say, and you don't know all the different avenues to land on and use to be creative enough for somebody to say, hey, leave me alone. So people quit long before they ever hear, leave me alone. My goal for you, no matter whether you sell retail, e-tail, whether you sell over the phone, wholesale, no matter what it is, business to business or business to consumer, okay? My goal here is to get the customer right to the edge of saying, don't call me again, but they don't. Instead, they say, man, you're amazing. Imagine if you followed up so creatively, so insistently, so persistently, and in so many different varied ways that right before they said, don't ever call me again, instead they said, man, you're incredible. You're amazing. I need to take another look at your product. Nobody cares about me as much as you do. And that's what we're going to do here with this follow-up. Number one, you got to pick up the phone. You got to make the call. You got to send the email. You got to send the text. You got to do it and quit thinking about it. Procrastination, organization, getting ready, planning. Yeah, that's great. But sooner or later, folks, sooner or later, and I talk about it in the 10X rule, hey, take actions, okay? Number two, frequency leads to greatness. You cannot be great swinging the bat one time, throwing the ball one time, playing the game one time. It's lots of different activity. To knock the competitor out requires frequencies, lots of jabs, okay? To win over the enemy, I need to bomb them over and over and over and over again. To get known in the marketplace, you need to be there over and over and over until the enemy the competition until your customer's like, okay, take me in, let's go, okay? Frequency leads to greatness. You cannot get great on follow-up without being frequent first. So be willing to be more frequent that you, than you are good in the beginning because the fact is you can't be good until you're frequent. Number three, get regular. Your follow-up needs to be on a regular regiment, okay? For instance, I have a zero, two calls that day. Day one, two calls that day. Day three, yeah, that's right, no, day two, zero, one, and two, I would make two more contacts. I need to get regular. I need to lay it out in my CRM. No matter what CRM you're laying out, you need to lay out your scripts, your pitches, your follow-up, and add creativity. It's not going to always be me talking to somebody. It might be a text. It might be a link. It might be a video. It might be a post on their Facebook page or their LinkedIn account. So use, get regular. Number four, you're waiting too long. Okay, speed is the new big. Speed. Like, you know, you're, you, you, you know the fable, right? The hare. The hare and the, and the tortoise. My daughter read about the hare and the tortoise the other day. At the end of it, I said, baby, what's the moral of the story? Okay? She's like, well, be, 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 the, be the tortoise. I said, no, baby. The, 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 the moral of the story. We scratched it out and I wrote it in. Okay? Be the hare and the tortoise. 
Be in both, okay? But don't pull over on the side of the road and take a nap, okay? Be frequent, be frequent, be in a hurry, be regular, and do it now, okay? You're waiting too long between follow-ups. You're waiting too long, number one, to follow up. And number two, you're waiting too long between follow-ups. I need to bomb the enemy over and over and over again. And you're like, oh, Grant, I'm too corporate for that. We're at Microsoft. And you guys at Microsoft, you need to bomb the enemy. Okay? You need to overwhelm the client with service. Be urgent to serve. I'm in a hurry to help. Regardless of your company, how big your company is, how big the brand is, whatever it is you're trying to protect, you don't build your brand out without selling your products, okay? And if you believe in your product and you believe in your service, then you will insist, management, that your people follow up creatively, insistently, use every different varied communication line to come in, but you've got to be creative to do that, okay? Oh, I'm worried about bothering the customer. They're so corporate, okay? doesn't matter. It's an executive in a company. If I have creative ways to follow up the guy that runs T-Mobile, and they're all creative ways. It might be his charity. It might be an email. It might be a video post. It might be a LinkedIn. It might be, hey man, send him a, a message within LinkedIn with a link. Hey, I saw that you made the Wall Street Journal. Congratulations. See, you immediately think that it's going to be pestering the customer because you lack so much creativity. You, you have such a narrow bandwidth for follow-up. Most of you depend on one tool. I don't, okay? You need a variety of reasons to call people. Lots of different reasons. Many, many different reasons. Thanks for coming by. Or it could be this. Why didn't you buy from us? From a third party. Or it could be, hey, we're doing a survey. Or it could be, hey, I got something in today that would lower your cost. Or it could be, hey, by the way, we want to invite you to a charity event. Or it could be number six, that's six right there, uh, posting on somebody's Facebook wall to your Facebook wall that you recommend them, that you're, you recommend your followers go see their and like their page. There's a seven follow-up right there. I could use all those in three days to literally bang, bang, not take one clean shot, Okay. Look, let's face it, the bigger the company, the more influencers, the more decision makers, and the longer the cycle. Means, it means the holy grail. If the reality of the situation is the 98-2 rule, you have to learn how to follow up, and you have to learn how to be creative, and you have to learn how to use different lines, and you have to have a variety. But don't forget, you need a clear purpose. What's your clear purpose? Why do you do follow-up? Dude, I, I follow people up for one reason. I follow people up to close a deal. Don't confuse your follow-up with some activity. My job is to close a deal. And lastly, do not leave a message. Always, always, always leave a message. A call not made is like a tree falling in the forest. If nobody was there, did anybody hear it? Hey, if you don't leave a message, did you actually make a call? Always, always, always leave a message. Hey, I hope these seven points out of a four-hour presentation help you. Okay, you need reasons. You're not lazy. You have to be creative. You're not lazy. You got to be creative. You're not lazy. You need a variety. You're not lazy. You're not going to make the sale 98% of the time without doing follow up. Hey, I hope this finds you well. Again, thank you, Inside Sales, for including me in this unbelievable summit, this great value to your customer base. God bless each of you. Great selling out there. And remember, push that customer on follow up until they're like, I almost want to say enough, but I don't. Instead, I say, you're incredible. Jack Welch is one of the world's most respected and celebrated CEOs. From 21 years as the CEO of GE to founding the Jack Welch Management Institute, Jack has been pivotal in the growth of executives and sales professionals throughout the world. The Welsh Way has become synonymous with success and achievement in business. Joining Jack is Dean Sippel, leader of strategic business and operations at Jack Welsh Management Institute. Dean draws on deep operations experience that spans several industries and has served in executive operations and finance positions in several publicly traded and Fortune 500 organizations.
Thanks for that introduction. Over the next 14 minutes, you're gonna be provided a powerful five-step framework that will help you build an effective sales strategy. Personally created by Jack Welch, this framework has been used by thousands of companies across the globe. It is battle-tested and proven. As the CEO of the Jack Welch Management Institute, we use these proven methodologies and principles daily in teaching our students and participants but we also use them to help us grow our own business. We've seen 40% annual growth over the last four years. and We find these principles to be very easy and effective to implement, and we believe you will too. The strategy to mean anything, it's gotta come alive. It's gotta be vibrant. It's gotta be the most agile thing about the company because times change quickly. The organization's gotta move but strategy is the job of the top group to put in place an absolute plan that says, where are we going? Agility is a word that should be tied to strategy. It should be fresh, it should be alive, you should get, the top people should put it together, but then everybody has to be brought on board. At every level of the organization, people play a part in executing that strategy. So you might be two levels down over here in an organization. You better have a story, which is what a strategy is, a story, that how your group fits into the total overall strategy. And so your group has its own mini strategy, if you will, as part of the overall company strategy. And you've got to be able to shift as the world shifts, depending on the business you're in. But if you go to a strategy and you think of it as a living, breathing, live document, not something you haul out at the strategy review session once a year when you get all dressed up in your best suit to go to the headquarters to present it. That doesn't work. You've got to think of, of strategy as being part of what everybody does when they come to work every day, knowing where they're going. You can't be detailed enough about knowing the, le the playing field. Size of the competitor, the look of their people, the culture of the company, the regional managers, the R&D manager, the marketing manager, their background. You'd like to know if Mary, the sales person in Boston, had a cold and was out for a week. That's how much you wanna feel about the competitor. Just in the past week, I've had four big businesses in my private equity portfolio come in to lay out their detailed view of the competitive environment. Each competitor, and I'll tell you, they were shocked going through the exercise. They saw things about the regional manager in Denver, about the R&D manager who just quit, things they wouldn't be thinking about all day if they weren't thinking in depth about the strategy and about the competitive environment in the most rigorous, detailed way. We made each of these companies put together organization shots, two levels down, of their competitor. They'd never done that before. Now, were they precise? Maybe not. But they learned more things about uh, who quit recently, what, what the disruptions were, and they followed up with plans based on those findings to take actions. So that's the first slide. I want you, as you go put your strategy together, to know that competitive game, like to know your back of your hand, like you know your family. That's the objective. You'll never quite get there, but that is how you gotta feel about that chart. We're talking now about what has the competitor done in the last year to change the playing field. Think about it. That has all kinds of side ramifications for you. If he did upset the playing field and get an advantage, where were you? What's missing in your thought process that you didn't have a move to make? Were you looking around corners well enough? Did you anticipate his move in new products? Did you have enough people engaged in the process to assess that? Did you get a good grasp of his position so that you could have 
jumped him earlier and blunted the impact of the move that he was making. Then when you look at your own move, that's relatively simple. You found a niche from the playing field analysis, the first chart. You found an opportunity. You may have found a new product. You may have hired a key, a key product development person or even a regional vice president. We've done that in, in several companies. The ideal way of looking at that is we've seen a competitor. I just saw that this week, in fact, where a competitor went in in the last year and bought a big regional distributor. And guess what the competitor forgot to do? Forgot to take care of the people in the regional distributor. So we went in and bought the regional manager, and we ended up with this whole team, and the competitor ended up with the building. In the end, the building is the least important part of the whole program. So we ended up with the team, put a new facility in, and took all the business. So that's the type of thing you've got to be playing back and forth in slide two and three. And as you do that, you'll get a real handle on how to jump, what happens while you're giving that rigorous dental analysis right down to the biggest cavity of your competitors, knowing everything about them. Turn that mirror around and say, your competitor X, looking at you, how would they draw that shot and describe you? How would they see your talent at every level? How would they see your R&D? Are you pushing the refresh button all the time on your team to be sure you've got the best talent in the best places, in the right places, and are putting the right resources on the right opportunities? So give yourself a deep dive right back into your own organization and be, be honest about it. I think the refresh button is one of the great things of all time, and organizations need a refresh button, particularly in today's world, where the skill levels are changing so fast. For example, in IT, go look at your IT or, or organization. Is it really getting the data it needs on customers? Is it really getting the data it needs to be competitive? Is it on the leading edge of big data like Amazon is, like IBM is? Or do you have milk run IT people that have been doing the same big systems for the last 15 years? Are they looking at social media fast enough? Are they fresh and familiar with it? Or are they yesterday's IT people? The refresh button on your own team has to be looked at as you're doing the deep dives on your competitive. So that gets you to four, slide four. That gets you to that point where what are you scared about? That's where you've got to involve lots of people in your organization. As many noses as you can get in the room who, who've sniffed out what that competitor might do, who are worried themselves, bring in the sales manager who'll tell you, Jesus, they're hiring 10 people. They're going to take over our whole position in the Rocky Mountains. If we don't gear up and get going, we're going to be hammered. Or I know that they hired this R&D person, and I know that we've got a shortfall in product Y over here. And so your R&D guy is in there with the salespeople, and they're talking about our shortfalls in product. So they can bring you all their fears. You want that to be a meeting where everybody is scared to death about what the competitor can do, and they talk about everything. They're even covering their butts to be sure that you know that they know if this happens, they're hammered. So you want to bring that meeting to life on that chart where, where holy cow, I can't sleep at night because I now know all the things that can happen to me. Once you're through chart four, they will have given you a million frightening things to be scared of. So you've got to now start to decide, I can't scatter shot and, do, and cover all those. 
but I can sure as hell make this acquisition. Or I can go in and kill that bad product direction I was going in and put a new product in. That is the key thing. It's everyone's thinking about what can we do? Let's make this acquisition. Let's steal these two people. Let's bring out a new product that fits in this niche. You can get all this stuff from four leads you to what you'll do in five. Well, there you have it. A simple, powerful five-step process to help you set up your strategy and win. If you're looking for further information on us, please feel free to visit us at www.jwmi.com. And thanks to everybody at Inside Sales. It's been a blast being part of this great group of presenters. And best of luck to all of you out there selling. Take care. Dave Matson is a best-selling author, sales and management thought leader, keynote speaker, and leader for sales training seminars around the world. As CEO and president of Sandler Training, Mr. Matson oversees the corporate direction and strategy for the company's global operations, including sales, marketing, consulting, alliances, and support. His key areas of focus are sales leadership, strategy, and client satisfaction. Dave is also the author of four best-selling books, Magical People Skills, Five Minutes with Vito, Sandler Rules, and Sandler Success Principles. Hi, it's Dave Matson, CEO of Sandler Training. Wow, what an honor it is to be with you here today. You know, in a short amount of time, I want to share with you three best practices that you can use immediately in your day-to-day -day sales activities. I'm going to be getting these from our Sandler Vault. You know, we've been in the training business for over 50 years. 19,000 people a year go through the Sandler Selling System in our 265 training centers around the world. You know, Sandler's won tons of awards. We've won best sales training, best sales management training. And we've sold more books. We've got a ton of number one sellers. Uh, but the award that I'm most proud of is the highest ROI, bar none, anyone in the industry for quota attainment for individuals and for teams. What does that mean? That means Sandler works. Many of you have probably gone through a Sandler course, but if not, the three best practices that I'm going to share with you today, you should be able to implement immediately. Let's try. Number one, have a sales process. Look, I'm not here to convert you to the Sandler selling system, but I am here to say, embrace process. You should know where you are today and what is necessary for you to progress to the next stage in your process. Here's how you can do it as an individual or you could do it as a team. What you're looking for is for you to document the things that you do from the very start of your process. And that could be research or it could be prospecting all the way to the end, which let's say is you've closed the business and now you're selling additional products and services 
to your customer. There's a lot of steps that are in between those two big picture items on the left and the right. So here's what I'd like you to do. One, why don't you test if you have process? And I know that the most effective companies and the effective salespeople that I know, I can say, what's your methodology? And they can rattle it off in two minutes. Step one is this, step two is this, step three is that. And that is muscle memory. If you can take out a piece of paper and just draw four or five boxes and say to yourself, what steps do I follow? And if you can do it without thinking, you have muscle memory, great. But 85, 86% of the organizations that I know, they struggle with this. As a matter of fact, everyone on their team has a slightly different picture. So if that's true for you, create muscle memory. Get a blank piece of paper. I want you to draw five, six, seven boxes. And I want you to say to yourself, what are the steps, big picture, that I follow from the time that I'm looking for a prospect, and a prospect could be within your customer base, and the time that my customer is sold and I'm selling additional products or services, what are the macro steps that you follow? You could do this individually or get some team members and do it as a collective group. So that's the first step. Now here's the second step. The second step will be for you to go and say, what are the two or three things that I need to accomplish under each one of those big picture steps in order for me to progress? For instance, if one of your blocks was qualification, which makes sense, you may say, well, in order for me to move from qualification to the next stage, that may be a, um, a pre-present, it could be a presentation, it could be proof of concept, whatever it is for you after qualification, you say, what are the three things that I need to do in that bucket? For Sandler, it may be we're going to qualify for pain. We're going to make sure they have three or four pains. We're going to qualify for budget, and we're going to qualify for decision. We want to make sure that our prospects are willing and able to proceed. But you have to decide what it is for you. Don't overcomplicate it and come up with 73 items that you have to accomplish before you move on. It's just a good GPS for you to say, look, I've got to make sure that I'm working intelligently because as you progress through the sales funnel, it's, it takes more time, it takes more money, and if you do it properly, your closing rate should increase. Look, prospects want you to move as quickly as you can through the sales funnel. They want to know what you know without any commitment on their end. So our first takeaway, have process. Become a scientist. Create it yourself. What are the big picture steps? And then what are the three or four mini steps under each one before I progress? Here's best practice number two. Have a pre-call planner. But make sure that it's usable. Here's what happens. Lots of times, amateur salespeople, we show up on calls and blah, throw up everything that we know. And we throw up in the hope that we say something interesting to our customer, our prospect, and they grab onto it. There are two things that professional salespeople, we struggle with every day, and it gets worse the more effective you become. And here's what it is. As you become more successful, we're fighting time. Everyone says, Dave, I, have, I don't have enough time. I'm going from call to call. I get that part. And the other thing that we rely on, and we shouldn't all the time, is our experience. What they say to themselves is, I don't need a pre-call planner. I can just show up. I've been doing this for 25 years. There's nothing that my prospect or customer will say that I haven't heard before. And you know what? That's probably true. That is probably true. But I like this phrase that I heard a long time ago. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. So think about it. You want your surgeon to prepare. I fly a lot, and maybe you do too. But every time I come down into the plane, I look over at the pilot. And the pilot has a check sheet. And they're checking off, and they're checking, is this working? Is this working? Is that working? Now, that pilot has as much experience as you do in the field. They've been flying for decades. They probably were in the military before that. You don't think they could look around and say, yeah, the plane looks good? Or that if anything happened in the air, they couldn't handle it? Maybe they could. But I think they realize that there's an awful lot of people who rely on them. 
just like there's an awful lot of people that rely on you, the organization, and your family. So have a pre-call checklist. Don't fall into the trap of, I'm experienced. Now, is that going to take a lot of your time? Well, here's what I believe. A pre-call planner should take 50% of your call time. So if you're going to be on a one-hour call, take 30 minutes and think about your client. If you're going on a team cell, you absolutely should do a pre-call planner. Well, what goes into a pre-call planner? And I've seen some that are six or seven pages long. And if it works for you, great. But you could make it pretty simple. So if it's a first-time prospect, you certainly could do a LinkedIn check. You could do a Google search, right? You're going to want to ask yourself, what are my goals for today's call? When the call's over, what do I want to have accomplished? Jot it down. Think about it. Is there anything that I should be taking with me on today's call? What are the top three or four questions that I want to ask on today's call? What's the behavioral profile of my prospect or customer? If I am taking a partner, what are their roles and responsibilities? What do I want them to talk about and for how long? What are the questions that I may be asked today? And how would I answer those? That's just a brief list of things that you could think about ahead of time. Here's our third best practice for today. No mutual mystification. What does that mean? That means that oftentimes we show up without a plan or we show up and don't really explain to our prospects or customers what our agenda is for today. You know, I think sales is a conversation. That means that if you want your customer or prospect to talk to you, you kind of have to tell them what the call's about and what you're trying to do. And when you do that, they get to participate in the conversation. And in human dynamics say, if you're just talking and the prospect doesn't know where you're going, then they really are looking at you and trying to figure out, well, what's going on? Well, where do I jump in? Are they going to talk about anything that's important to me? I think a call that starts well ends well. And so there are a couple things that we teach at Sandler called an upfront contract. And out of the 19,000 people that go year in and year out, they'll always send me letters and say, Dave, I've implemented that upfront contract and it is rock solid. And here's what it is. I believe you should start every call and really end every call because you're going to talk about your next call, talking about some key things. Let me give you four of them. Number one, purpose. Before you start the call, make sure that you're on the same page as why we're here today. You know, George, I know we spoke on the phone, but today I thought our purpose was, and then say it out loud. It's good for you to do that because oftentimes they have forgotten as well. Or if you've ever been in a situation when there's a new person joining your call, sometimes they don't know why they're there. So purpose is important. Level set why we're here. Number two, time. Review how much time that you have for the call. It'll sound like this. You know, George, I know last week we spoke about spending about 60 minutes for today. Is that still good for you? Why am I doing that? Well, A, I want to test time up front because have you ever been in a situation where you thought you had an hour because that's what you talked about maybe a week or a month ago? You show up, you're doing your thing, and 20 minutes into the call, the prospect does this. Dave, this sounds really interesting. Uh, but listen, we've got a ton of things going on here today, and it's really crazy. Would you put what you're about to say and all the good things you did say in writing and then send it off to me, and I'll review it at my convenience? Have you ever heard that before? Well, the reason you heard that midway through is because you didn't test how much time was given for you today, even though you thought it was an hour. So I don't think there should be any surprises. So when you ask somebody, hey, we talked about 60 minutes, is that still good? One, you show respect. Two, you'll know up front if there's a fire drill going on in, with your prospect or customer and you need to shorten your time. I don't mind shortening my time. I want to know about it before I start. The third thing that you want to do is deal with agendas. That's their agenda and my agenda. I'll always say something like this. Well, when I'm with CEOs like yourself, there's always two or three things they want to make sure that I cover before we end our meeting today. Anything pop up for you? Now, why am I doing that? I want to know what's important to them. If they say, yeah, Dave, I, want a little, I, know, I want to know about Sandler, 
I want to know about your success rate, then I want to make sure I cover that and I acknowledge that. It's respectful and it's good for a salesperson to understand what's important to that prospect. On the flip side, I'm going to talk about my agenda. Here are the two or three things that I'd like to talk about as well. I'm saying that up front so they are comfortable when it happens. They're not shocked. The last thing that I'd like you to cover is what we call outcome. Tell them what you'd like to decide at the end of the call. So when we end today, we should be in a position to decide whether we should do X. It could be have another call, it could be go proof of concept, whatever it is for you. Hopefully these three best practices you could use today. If you've loved what you've heard, go to Sandler.com, look for the local training center, and pick out a program that matches something that you'd love to see. Just call them up and say, we saw Dave, and I'm coming as my guest. Enjoy the day, take tons of notes, and become the best that you can be. Until we see each other face-to-face, -face, good selling.